Welcome to our worship here at Monmouth Baptist Church online this evening. So glad that you're able to join us from your home, whether you're watching live or streamed uh, as a video a little bit later. We're going to be exploring uh, the prophecy of Habakkuk, continuing in our study and looking at the end of chapter 3 this evening, one of the highest statements of faith that can be found in the whole of Scripture. Pray the Lord will encourage and challenge us as we look at those verses together. But uh, let's begin by affirming with Habakkuk that the Lord and his salvation is the source of our joy and hope in a whole world. So let's turn our thoughts to the Lord, let's think of him, and let's lift our hearts and our voices as we praise him together. The grace of God has reached for me And pulled me from a raging sea And I am safe on this solid ground The Lord is my salvation I will not fear when darkness falls His strength will help me scale these walls I'll see the dawn of the rising sun The Lord is my salvation is hidden in the Lord. He flowers each promise of His Word. When winter fades, I know spring will come. The Lord is my salvation. In times of waiting, times of need, when I know lost, when I am weak, I know His grace will renew these days. The Lord is my salvation. Glory 
Habakkuk chapter 3 A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day. In our time make them known. In wrath remember mercy. God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens, and his praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from his hand, where his power was hidden. Plague went before him, pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled and the age-old hills collapsed. His ways are eternal. I saw the tents of Kushan in distress, the dwellings of Midian in anguish. Were you angry with the rivers, O Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode with your horses and your victorious chariots? You uncovered your bow. You called for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. Torrents of water swept by. The deep roared and lifted its waves on high. Sun and moon stood still in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows, at the lightning of your flashing spear. In wrath you strode through the earth, and in anger you threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. With his own spear you pierced his head, when his arrows stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched you were hiding, you were in, who were in hiding. You trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. I heard and my heart pounded, my lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones, and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity, to come on the nation invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. Habakkuk
Well, it's lovely to sing those words inspired by Habakkuk chapter 3 and, of course, Job as well. Um, it's a, a great testimony of confidence in the Lord, whatever is happening in our lives. And uh, we're grateful to Alan for reading Habakkuk chapter 3 for us. We've listened to it last week and this week as well. Let's turn to the Lord and pray together. Let's pray. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. Lord, we seek your face. We know of your deeds and might that you have accomplished across the ages. Just as you rescued your people from Egypt, you saved your, uh, your people, led them through the desert, supplied their needs and brought them into a land. But even more wonderful, Lord, was the, the day in which the Lord Jesus went to the cross to pay for our sins. And having died and being buried, was raised again on the third day, achieving salvation for us, defeating death, conquering sin and Satan, and all that would keep us from knowing and enjoying you forever. Lord, we thank you for your great salvation. And as we've been reading these words, Lord, we are conscious that still around the world today, your people suffer. There is persecution. Uh, there are obstacles and barriers put in the way. People are hurt or imprisoned or fined. Some are even killed simply because they own the name of Jesus and love to follow him. Lord, would you give them strength and encouragement? Help them to know the truth of your word that yet I will rejoice in the Lord and I will be joyful in God my Saviour. And we pray, Lord, that we'll know that same truth in our lives, whatever challenges we're facing, whatever might be failing in our lives. Help us to rejoice in you, our God and Saviour. Help us to see you as a mighty God who's powerful and victorious, who uh, rides forth on behalf of your people, as uh, Habakkuk saw you doing as he imagined you as a, as a warrior fighting on their behalf. And help us even now, Lord, with the things that we battle with, to know that the battle belongs to you, that you can make our feet steady and swift on the heights as we travel through life, trusting joyfully in you, our Savior, whatever the circumstances are that surround us. Lord, um, we pray that in our time, you might renew your deeds. Here in Wales, we have heard of them so often, of revivals, countless in the past, movements where your people, filled with your spirit, have preached the word, have sought your face, and have seen many brought to salvation, sinners saved, peoples changed. And this is what we pray for still today in our increasingly secular nation. We ask, Lord, for your mercy. We pray for faithful Bible teaching. We pray for Holy Spirit-filled people who are sanctified to you and willing for you to use us for your glory, whatever the cost might be. We pray, Lord, that you will revive your people and save the lost. We ask, Lord, that you will turn the tide even here in Monmouth, that once again we will see people seeking after you. In 1905, Lord, we know the revival never reached this part of Wales, but we pray for it today. We pray, Lord, not for a 1905 or an 1800s revival, but for a 2020 reviving of people, uh, of a move in which uh, there is a deeper walk with you, a greater passion for truth and holiness, and a desire to walk in your ways. Oh Lord, we seek you because only you can do this. We have heard of your fame. We stand in awe of your deeds. Renew them in our day and in our time. Make them known. Lord, as Habakkuk reflected on the troubles and challenges that would come upon your people, he trusted in you. He waited patiently for you. And we ask, Lord, that we will wait patiently and pray urgently. Help us to be like that here in Monmouth and in our nation as we seek your face today. Lord, we need your forgiveness. Would you pour it afresh into our lives because of the cross of Jesus? Uh, it's him who we, we desire to lift up, and it's him who we know will draw people to himself as they look to him. 
And Lord, as we draw our prayers to a close, we ask, Lord, that your glory will shine and be seen both here um, and around the world. Habakkuk, look forward to the day when the knowledge of the glory of the Lord uh, would fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. May our world know more of your glory even today. Amen. And as we think about God's glory shining, uh, perhaps one of the most well-known uh, modern hymns, Shine, Jesus, Shine, um, which has inspired and encouraged so many people. It's been a prayer for decades that the Lord would fill this land with the Father's glory. And uh, recently, Graham Kendrick uh, produced a virtual band um, reproducing this song, and uh, I encourage you to join in singing along with them now. James uh, passed this song on to us. Thank you, James. We're going to sing it together this evening.
Uh, it was great to sing that uh, time-honored song. And uh, I hope that the words also encourage you as part of our praying to pray for the Lord's glory to be poured out for Jesus to shine. Now, um, we're going to look at Habakkuk chapter 3 and the end of this chapter. Uh, I hope that you've got it in front of you from verses 16 to 19. There's a rugby player who had printed on his boots, Hab 319, Jesus is the way. Of course, Habakkuk 3.19 speaks of being able to have feet like the feet of a deer. And I suppose it's because the player wanted to have quick feet, fast running, to be able to score those tries. But Jesus is the way, acknowledging that actually in the bigger picture of things, to be able to have fast feet, to be able to go up on the heights in them, is something that only the Lord is able to do. And we're going to look at this, probably one of the most moving statements of faith in the whole of Scripture. Chapter 2 was perhaps the most influential statement of faith. This is a very important book. And uh, in verse two, uh, sorry, verse 4 of chapter 2, the righteous will live by faith. Uh, it inspired the Apostle Paul, the writer to the Hebrews, and of course, uh, was formative in the conversion of Martin Luther and the foundation stones of the Protestant Reformation, a return to discovering that salvation is by grace through faith. So this emphasis on faith is important, and perhaps we could summarize the whole letter uh, by saying that in chapter 1, there is a crisis of faith. In chapter 2, a call to faith and here in chapter 3 is the crown or the commitment or the conviction even of faith. And we're going to look at the end of this chapter. In the first part, we see how Habakkuk um, is uh, opening up his heart as he remembers the things of God and looks to him. And progressively through the chapter, this great song that he has written, we see a progression in the pronouns that are used. At the beginning, he speaks of his glory. God is, is out there, as it were, doing his thing. And then there's the personal address, you. He starts talking to God in a personal way, not just about him, but talking to him. And finally, we're in a section where he uses the words, I. He speaks of himself. And this is his final uh, place where, where he, he's nailing his colors to the mast of saying, this is where I stand. But before he gets there, in verse 16, he just reflects back in, the, in, in terms of the greatness and power of God and his mighty deeds and name. He says at the end, uh, where he, he has, he's seen these great things, he says that it caused him to tremble. He was terrified when he thought of how God was going to allow the Babylonians to, to come in to invade the land and do the terrible, uh, vicious, evil things that they would do. And Habakkuk uh, was fearful. This is one of the, his objections in the first place. How could God possibly use such wickedness to accomplish his purposes? And uh, he says this at first, I heard my heart pounded. Have you ever been so scared that your heart has pounded? Maybe you've been walking home on a dark night and uh, it, it, there's not been many people around. Perhaps you've been foolish enough to travel on a, a roller coaster and maybe there's a point at which you could literally feel your heart pounding. But for Habakkuk, this is real fear. His lips quivered. Again, have you ever been in a position where you've been so scared you couldn't get the words out properly? And decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Uh, he could hardly stand. He felt he couldn't even move. He was pinned to the spot or collapsing where he was. That was the impact of him really recognizing and thinking about the dealings of God. And maybe it would do us good to recapture something of that sense of awe and might and majesty, the fear of the Lord, not afraid, but true awe and respect of him as we were looking at a little last week. Maybe that wouldn't be so bad. And yet, he says, and this is the turning point, that word, just a little word, yet I will wait 
patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Because that's what God had said. They are going to come. There will be some terrible things that will happen. But the Babylonians, for all their pride and arrogance and their hedonistic lifestyle and idolatry, judgment will come upon them. And Habakkuk would love to have seen it all happen now and to have skipped the middle bit. Uh, we're like that, aren't we? We're always in a hurry to see things happen. That's why we have microwaves and machines that are supposed to make everything happen more quickly. Uh, we're eager for things to happen quickly. But Habakkuk's statement of faith, his conviction, this crowning conviction at the end of his letter, uh, of his prophecy of this song, is I will wait. Fear and awe at God's fighting power. And it echoes verse 7 and verse 2. There are, there are the, um, there's the distress of the enemies in verse 7. In verse 2, he's in awe of the Lord's deeds. Uh, now he himself is trembling before God and waiting. And in a way, this book is all about questions and trembling, isn't it? Uh, Habakkuk feeling he can ask the questions, and yet he is... He is in awe before God. He humbles himself before him. Isn't it great that it's possible to be respectful and honoring of the Lord and yet to bring our deepest questions to him? We're allowed to do that. And Habakkuk's waiting isn't a kind of uh, grin and bear it kind of waiting. Uh, he's not ignoring the reality of this situation. Um, it's not an idealism or, or a head in the clouds or a head in the sand, whatever you might call it. Instead, uh, this is a, a waiting that leads to joy, to faith, to trust. And the bottom line is that his confidence is not in the circumstances around him. At first, he was moved by the sins of, of the people he lived with, and his own sins, no doubt. And then he's moved by the sins of the nations around him. But at the end of the day, what really directs his heart and life this foundation, this center for his life, is his confidence in God, his willingness to trust in the Lord as his rock and his strength. And because of that, uh, he, he says, yet I will wait patiently for a day of calamity. The NIV has the day, but uh, it's um, uh, got no article there. There is a day of calamity that will come. He knows that something will happen. And of course, in 539 B.C., uh, the Babylonians were uh, overcome by the Medes and the Persians, who then became the next empire ruling the known world of the time. But it was a picture of, of a day of judgment that will one day bring the final day when all evil, all wickedness, all sadness and suffering in this world will be gone. Are you eagerly waiting for that day? Are you hoping for it? taking a long time, 2,000 years, but the Lord will come and there will be a day when all that is wrong will be put right. So verse 16 is a great encouragement to us to continue to wait and to serve and to look to the Lord while we await the day on which uh, his judgment will come. And we will stand before him with confidence because in Jesus we are forgiven and it's only in Jesus that we can stand on that day. And so knowing that the Lord will bring about that day in his time, Habakkuk then takes himself into the things that will happen before the day comes, in which Babylon will be dealt with in their immediacy for him. And we know that the Babylons, uh, Babylonians had this scorched earth policy. And so uh, they would do things like destroy fruit trees and crops, and they would take away or destroy animals, so that the people would be left with utterly nothing. Those who were left behind, they'd leave a small number of people uh, left in lands, and everyone else would be deported to other countries. This was how the Babylonians worked. And as they were the rising power at the time Habakkuk is preaching to the people, no one would believe that this would possibly happen, but he can see it, he knows it, and he's saying, even if the Babylonians come and the fig tree doesn't bud and there's no grapes on the vines and the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, there's no sheep in the pen or cattle in the stalls, he, he's seeing and picturing the terrible things that can happen in the course of ordinary life 
but he's got those, those Babylonians on the horizon, as it, he can see them, as it were. And he says, yet I will rejoice. Here's another yet. Habakkuk, the yet man, not the yes man. Yet I will wait, yet I will rejoice. This is uh, his crowning conviction at the end of the song. Is it yours? He faced a merciless and effective enemy. And yet he could say, I will be joyful in God my Savior. Uh, the fig trees, the fruit vines, the olive trees, all represent the most essential things of life for the people of Israel. We might say, yet if the cupboards are bare, or yet if I lose my job, or yet if illness comes upon me, I will rejoice in the Lord. Can you say that? Because that's what Habakkuk has, the place where he has reached in faith, and where you and I can reach. We can see more than him. We know more than him. And yet, it's so hard sometimes in our troubles to find this same faith and joy in the Lord. But it's because in the early part of his psalm and song, he is seeing God as being sovereign. This chapter culminates with this high statement of faith. It's, such a, it's an ultimate statement, isn't it? You can't get higher than this. And, and it's because he knows God is in control. God is in charge. I don't know his times, and I'm not in a position to question his methods, but I do know that he is in control. And it's that which makes him rejoice knowing that there is a God who saves his people, and he rejoices, even though his people will be led into exile, and they'll face all these terrible things in the meantime. Some people talk about being a high churchman, or being high church, and usually it means that they like uh, church with a lot of uh, sacramental ideas, and ritual, and, and so on, a lot of circumstance, and sort of high drama depicted um, in the, the act of worship, and, and, and the way in which church sort of operates. But I can tell you that I would rather be a high churchman like Habakkuk, uh, because his faith takes him to the high places, the highest places of all. And that's the kind of high churchmanship that we really need, isn't it? To have a kind of faith that takes us to the heights with feet like those of a deer that can still gallop on the edge of a mountain. Yes, speedily moving along. This is what uh, Habakkuk has discovered. And this is what the rugby player was thinking of um, who had this text on his boots. That it's not just about making it through daily life. It's about looking to the Lord. It's about saying, I will rejoice in him. Alex Grant was a, a pioneer missionary. He uh, was um, working in China, and on one occasion he was in a meeting, and he got up, and he very solemnly read these words. Let me read them to you again from Habakkuk 3.17. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines... Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. He read those words and then he paused for a moment and he looked up and he said, what could the devil do with a man like that? And he sat down. A sermon in a sentence, as some might say. Yes, what could the devil do with a man like that, with a woman like that, who can say, though everything has crashed around me, I will rejoice in the Lord. It's, a, it's an awesome, high churchmanship statement of faith that strips away all ritual and all drama and brings us right to the foot of the throne of God to say, you are my joy, whatever happens. To say with Job, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. And uh, I'm sure there is great challenge to us in this. So let's uh, think of perhaps three things, two or three things, that might help us apply it to our lives. And the first 
uh, is just the matter of prayer itself. Habakkuk, by this point, is talking to himself. He's saying what he will do, or at least he's telling others, he's telling God. And this was written as a song for others to sing too, like you and me, uh, using contemporary words, of course. At first, he's had images of torrential floods, of collapsing mountains, of plague and pestilence and lightning and raging seas. Uh, He calls God's people to recognize that God is sovereign over these things. And let me tell you, if God isn't sovereign over these things, there is a higher power in the world. Get on that higher power's right side. Because if God is not in charge of them, then we are all lost and helpless. But he is. Uh, And Habakkuk pictures these things going before him, God allowing these things to happen, God being awesome and and powerful and sovereign, and um, all these things come from God's hand, and and his heart has pounded within him, hasn't it? And he leads the people in prayer. He prays when he sees the world collapsing. He prays when he sees plague and pestilence. He would say to a COVID-19 pandemic-struck world, renew your deeds, O Lord. Rescue your people. Revive your people. Save the lost. That's what he would be praying. And he writes this song for this very purpose, that when the Babylonians do come in, and when plague and pestilence strikes, they can pray. And they'll say, Lord, we remember the things you've done. We will talk to you about it. He leads them in prayer. He writes a song. I love the way, right at the end, he says, uh, the director of music uh, is to play this on my stringed instruments. He's a singer. He's got a collection of instruments that he's using to praise the Lord, and he wants others to join in with this awesome song. He wants them to sing. He wants them to pray. And this is one of the best things that we could do. Sometimes our hearts are so heavy, we don't feel we can sing, but we can listen to the praises of God. We can read these words, and we can say, Lord, I remember your deeds. I've heard of your fame. Renew them in our day. Pray to him. This is the first thing. It's very practical. How do I get the kind of faith that Habakkuk has at the end? Well, he's prayed. That's the the first thing. The second thing we see here is he knows a depth of contentment, like the Apostle Paul, who could say that he knew what it was to have uh, plenty and to have nothing, to be weak or strong, whatever it might be. In fact, one writer says that there is a carelessness about biblical faith, a carelessness in the sense that Uh, We're careless for ourselves because we know that ultimately God has it all in control. It's not about caring less, of course, and it's not about being um, uh, inactive, but it's the truth that we know God will have the last word. And so we can be content. We can say, Lord, I'm, I'm content with what you have provided for me because you are with me in it. You know what's best. You're God. I'm just a, a weak, frail human being. And this gives strength and sustenance uh, and comfort when we know solely in the Lord that our contentment can be found. Uh, And it really impacts us today because it means that evil will not have the last word. Dictators will not have the last word. Viruses will not have the last word. Environmental disaster will not have the last word. Political uh, turmoil will not have the last word. It will be Jesus. It will be the Lord. And it's that which gives contentment. God never forsakes those who are looking to him. And so uh, when we might say, looking at the world and the troubles that we're in today, we might say, what is the world coming to? And the answer is it's coming to Christ. The world is heading in his direction. And we will all stand before his throne one day. So this can give us contentment. There was a Puritan pastor called Henry Smith. Uh, In fact, his his sermons, his printed sermons, were so popular that publishers would actually make sermons up because they made so much money if they couldn't get hold of the originals. Uh, Anyway, this Puritan pastor, he says, there are two things which make us take our troubles uh, very deep to heart. They hurt us and pain us. One because we do not expect them before they come. They come as a surprise, don't they? And our troubles are often a surprise 
Uh, I know there are some people who expect the worst and are glad when the best happens, but for most of us, troubles come as a surprise, and that makes them more grievous to us, don't they? But the second thing is that he says, we are like the prophet's servant who saw his enemies but not his friends. And we see our sore but not our salve. You will go through a sea of troubles, and then you will come to the haven of rest. In every trouble, you will know where to find your remedy. And this is the secret to contentment, is knowing that God is in control, he's in charge, we can trust him, even when we're going through painful times ourselves. I don't know what painful times you're going through, but can you find contentment in the Lord? Can you look to him like Habakkuk did? He really went through it, and he knew what it meant to trust him. Well, not only is there prayer and contentment, but there's also the clue and secret of happiness described here. As Habakkuk makes his personal confession, he doesn't say, I feel happy. He doesn't say, when the world is going wrong, I'll be glad on the days when I get out of the right side of bed. He says, I will rejoice, I will be joyful. It's an act of will. He says it is something I will do. It's a choice that I'm going to make. Because we're often shaped by our troubles and circumstances, by the urgent, as someone calls it, the tyranny of the urgent. We're shaped by these things. And Habakkuk says, I will not be shaped by them. Instead, I will find joy in the Lord. So he's not saying, smile and be happy. He's not saying, be happy like the feral song. You know, it's, it's not, a, uh, it's not a, a sense of, I feel happy, and so I, I'm, I'm going to sort of express it. But tomorrow I might not. It's not um, always looking on the bright side of life, or even packing up our troubles in our old kit bag and smile, smile, smile. You know, the man who wrote the tune for that, um, his brother wrote the words, uh, the man who wrote the tune for that, he played that song and he went out and he shot himself. If only he'd known where to find the place to pack up his troubles. But he knew it wasn't as simple as packing them in your kit bag and smiling as you go along. It's not real, is it? For Habakkuk, happiness is something you choose it's not the circumstances that make you feel. So, uh, Cowper, William Cowper, he, he, he writes a hymn. He, he was a man who knew what it was to be depressed, uh, to struggle and wrestle uh, with his, his feelings and, uh, and sadness and, uh, and all kinds of things. And he wrote many uh, encouraging and wonderful hymns. There's one hymn uh, entitled, Sometimes a Light Surprises the Christian While He Sings. Sometimes a light surprises a Christian while he sings. That's an uh, echo of Habakkuk here, isn't it? As you sing, as you use my instruments, as you sing these words, may you discover the joy of the Lord as well. You can choose, he's saying. And so uh, the source of happiness is to find that there's an urgency in talking to God in prayer, but a confidence in waiting. And it can help us to, to be truly happy or joyful. Though I lose my job, my business, my, uh, an illness comes upon me, a crisis, I will rejoice. And this passage is saying there is no guarantee of great circumstances. There are some people in churches who say, if you have enough faith, you'll never get sick. Or if you have enough faith, you'll be rich. And the suggestion is, if you don't have enough faith, that's why you're poor and why you're ill. It's an unbiblical idea. Habakkuk's deep faith here says, yet I will rejoice. Because in the midst of the fig tree not flowering and the animals dying, and he's saying, I will still look to the Lord. There is no promise in the Bible of material blessing or comfortable lives, but there is a promise that we can be confident in God. But did you notice how he describes him? His joy is not just that there's a God there who made the world or a God who vaguely loves us and pats us on the head and says we can just do what we like, really, and uh, it'll be okay. No, this is the God who is the Lord. This is the God who is a savior, who rescues. And this, I'd just like to dwell on for a moment because this is so important for us. 
his confidence, his joy, his happiness, the God he's praying to is the God who saves and rescues. And he's going to wait for God to do that because in the moment it doesn't look like God is saving and rescuing. So his confidence is in a salvation he doesn't yet see and doesn't yet experience. Earlier in the chapter, he speaks of God as a God of wrath and mercy. And this is the key, you see. Salvation is for sinners who are in danger of judgment and being lost forever. And the joy is discover that God might save me. Why me? And there's joy in knowing that I'm safe in his care because there is a saviour who died on a cross for me. Habakkuk only has glimpses of these things. How much more we know. Uh, And let me tell you that if you only see this vague love of God and you don't see that he's angry with sin or that he judges wickedness, if we don't see his holiness as well, then we don't actually have anything that's useful to us. Because if God is just a vaguely loving God who does nice things to us, then when things go wrong, we've got nothing that can help us. Because all we can say is, I I must have done something to upset him. But Habakkuk doesn't have a faith like this. He has a faith in the whole God, the true God, the living God, a saving God, a judging God, a sovereign God, a holy God. This is God who is merciful and kind to you. The God who is going to punish sin, which we deserve, who says, I found a way to rescue sinners. And that's something to rejoice in. And yes, there may be crisis happening in my life. There may be things that are going wrong everywhere, but there is one solid rock that God has sent his son who died for sinners. And at the cross, wrath and mercy met. The punishment of sin and the saving of sinners. The Son bearing our sins upon the cross, taking the blame himself so that we could be set free. This is how you can be happy. This is how we can find contentment. It's knowing that whatever happens, there is this unshakable foundation at the cross of Jesus, that there is a God of salvation. And when I come to the cross, I say, Lord, I know how wicked I am. I know what my heart is like. I don't deserve for you even to look at me. And yet, in your tremendous love, you've brought this sinner up. That's what God's love is like. It's a love for sinners. Not a weak, putrid kind of vague love that permeates everything. It is holy love. It is saving love. And the scriptures are full of it in the New as well as the Old Testament. That's why you and I can be rescued and saved. And these people would go through a lot in Babylon. They would hang up their harps. They would ask, how can we sing the songs of the Lord in this land? They were filled with pain as they sat by the rivers of Babylon and wept. Yes, some of you are thinking of the words of Boney M even now, aren't you? But they wept for what? Their sins, their lost. And maybe, maybe Habakkuk's son would have come to mind. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. And as they adapted to life in Babylon, as they gathered around the scriptures and the word of God, they began to be equipped and prepared for a new way of living in the land and out of it. Great fruit and revival came from it. And Habakkuk's song formed a foundation for their discovery that true happiness is in the Lord not in the things he gives us. So what does Habakkuk have to say to us in the middle of a a global pandemic? Well, he might tell us to look past our circumstances to the God who is sovereign and good, to the God who will deal with evil and wickedness and suffering, and who, while he is waiting for that to happen, we can trust and share his salvation. He might just tell us that rejoicing in him is not an activity based on our circumstances or feelings. He might say it's based on the conviction that God saves his people. It's in a crisis that God is still a savior. And that's why here at the end, Habakkuk can say he 
is mine, my saviour. Is he yours? Well, Henry Bosch, another preacher from the past, tells a story about a woman who was very discouraged because of all the problems that she was experiencing. And as she was walking down the street, she met uh, another believer who said, well, how are you doing today? And she said, oh, with this awful bitter shrug, she said, not too bad under the circumstances. And uh, the Christian, the other Christian said very quickly, well, get above the circumstances. That's where Jesus is. And that's what we need to do. The prophet thought the same. He refused to let circumstances dampen his faith, his trust in the Lord. He asked his questions. He prayed with urgency, but he found happiness and contentment in knowing that the Lord was in charge. He rejoiced in God my Savior. Not God my creator, not God the, these vague things that I'd like him to be, but the true God who saves sinners who is the Lord in charge of everything. Look to him like that, and you'll find what Habakkuk did as well. And there's one last thing that I just mentioned here, and that's um, uh, uh, that those who have these convictions can run on the heights. They can walk on difficult places. Their feet will be steady. And that's because if the circumstances shape our feelings, and we let our feelings lead us through life, Life is wobbly. It's uncertain. We're looking the wrong way. But when our eyes are fixed on a sovereign God who is holy and yet accepts us at the cross of Jesus, there's nothing that can shake that. And there's a, a, a tennis superstar, uh, Arthur Ashe. He died of AIDS. Um, he contracted it from a blood transfusion during heart surgery. Uh, but he, he was also a, a faithful believer and when he was told that he contracted this terrible uh, disease, he could have become very self-pitying. And probably the first question that he might have asked would have been, why me? I suspect you might ask that question, why does this happen to me? But this is what he said when someone asked him. He said, if I asked why me about my troubles, I'd also have to ask, why me about my blessings? Why am I winning at Wimbledon? Why marrying a beautiful, gifted woman? Why having a wonderful child? And his attitude challenges those who often grumble when things go wrong. Why me? Why is God letting this happen to me? Even if we're really terribly suffering like he was, we must not forget the blessings of God. Or we must at least say, why me for these blessings? Why these good things? You see, life doesn't work like that. It's not, why me? It should be, Lord, I trust you, and your feet will soar when you trust him like that. He will take you on the heights. You walk steadily through life, whether there are obstacles and rocks and slippery paths and uh, precipices uh, or whatever it might be. Your feet will be firm. If you talk to him in prayer, if you've discovered that in God your Savior, there is happiness and contentment. Well, I pray that the Lord will bless his word to us to encourage you to have, uh, discover the way to have the faith which Habakkuk himself knew and experienced. And uh, I hope that we'll encourage each other as well to look to him, that whatever happens in the midst of trouble, we can rejoice in God our Savior. So should we do that with perhaps one of the uh, most helpful hymns that describes this, that uh, when troubles like sea billows roll, uh, I've said, taught my soul to say, it is well with my soul. So we'll close tonight by singing, When Peace Like a River. Thank you.